Shalom. Welcome to a teaching by Beit Shalom, a One New Man ministry. Our message for today is continuing the series of modern, the modern state of Israel. If, is it a prophetic fulfillment or not? And this would be part four of that teaching. And just by way of review, we've been looking at different passages that speak on this topic. So we started with um, Amos. Amos chapter 9, and we are now in the other significant passage or chapters of the Bible which talk about the return of a, a people to the land, and that's in the book of Ezekiel. So the last time in part 3, we looked at Ezekiel chapter 34, and today our focus is going to be on Ezekiel chapter 36. So there are three main chapters within the book of Ezekiel that are relevant and germane to this topic, which is chapters 34, 36, and 37. We dealt with 34 in part 3, so today's 36. And just to quickly set the scene, I'll recap what 34 was about. What 34 was about began with the Lord God's prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. He calls them out, and he finds them lacking he finds them not doing the job. Their job was to rescue the lost, to feed the sheep. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to dismiss those shepherds. And then he says, I am going to be their shepherd. And I will rescue them. I will bring them from all of the places that they've been scattered, physically and spiritually. And I'm going to make a covenant of shalom with them. So the Lord God is our great and good shepherd. So it makes a lot of sense. By the time Yeshua comes, he is, he's portrayed as the good shepherd. Because he found, he found all the other shepherds, human men, lacking. They were assigned a job, but they were not about feeding the sheep. In fact, Ezekiel 34 says, they were feeding themselves on the sheep. The sheep became the prey <laughs> for the shepherds. Anyways, that was chapter 34. So today is chapter 36. And just to give you a bird's eye view of what chapter 36 is, before we get into the details, chapter 36 focuses now on the, having dismissed the shepherds of Israel and the Lord God becoming the shepherd of Israel uh, in chapter 34, 36 then gets into this Lord God, who is the shepherd of Israel, first restoring the land. Just like we saw the rain fall a few seconds ago, right? The land was crying out for some relief from the heat. Um, and, and so, and you know, the, the Lord God, by the way, pays attention to the earth. He's not, he doesn't just pay attention to us. He pays attention to everything that he's created. If it were not for his handiwork, his continued maintenance, you think all of the stars and the planets would stay in their orbits? He has fine-tuned everything, and he holds them in his hands. So first, the good shepherd restores the land, that's 30, Ezekiel 36, and then after the restoration of the land, he physically gathers his people, his people Israel, from all of the places that they've been scattered. So there's a restoration, restoration of the land, followed by a physical regathering of the people. Now the physical regathering does not mean that uh, it's like a come to, the come to church moment. It's just saying, just come to Jackson, New Jersey. We have other things to talk about, but first you come to Jackson, New Jersey, right? After you come, the, the Lord God then does a spiritual restoration. He gives them a new heart and a new spirit. So there's a sequence, that, there's an order to things. First the land is prepared, then the people are brought to the land, and then the Lord God says, come, let us reason together. I have something to give you. Will you drink of this water that I give you? Streams of living water. Maim Chaim. Maim Chaim, that's what Yeshua is offering. So that's kind of the overview of Ezekiel 36. So today, um, we'll jump into some of the details. And I don't think we'll be done with Ezekiel 36 today, but let's, uh, let's dive into the details. So, <coughs> so 
So we'll begin with Ezekiel 36, verse 1. So remember that I said the first thing the, that the Lord God does is not speak to the people. What does he have to do? He has to restore the land. So guess what the Lord God does? He speaks to the land. He speaks to the land. Verse 1. You, son of man, meaning Yechezkel or Ezekiel, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, Mountains of Israel, hear the word of Adonai. You know what this sounds like? Shema Israel, hear O Israel, right? There the, there the Lord is saying, you people of Israel, listen to me. And here it is. You mountains of Israel, listen to what I have to say. Every time the word you appears in Ezekiel 36, it's not people, it's the land. Do you know the Lord God is God over all things? Animate and inanimate over your house? over your car, Amen. over all things. He can speak to them because the substance that they're made of is from Him. Verse 2, Thus says Adonai Elohim, The enemy has said against you, Who is you? Again, the land, not the people. The enemy has said against you, Aha! Even the ancient high places have become our possession. So this is not saying... Where the, you know, this is not where the enemies of Israel are saying, oh look, we got the people and they're captive, they're our prisoners. No. This is the enemies of Israel saying, the high places, the ancient high places of Israel, they have become our possession. Not the people of Israel. The high places have become our possession. But therefore, do you understand the significance of therefore? This prophecy about restoration of the land is based on, and is, if I can use the word, inspired by, inspired by the enemies of Israel saying, when they look at the land, oh look, you've become our possession. What's wrong with them saying that? Because it is not their possession. It was not given to them. That's what's wrong. The Lord God says, I gave this to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, others to whom it was not given come and say, oh, this is ours now. The Lord has a problem with this. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, Because they have ravaged and crushed you from every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations, and you became the talk and evil gossip of people. Because all these things happened to you, the land that I have set apart for my people. Verse 4, Therefore mountains of Israel, Hear the word of Adonai. Do you see the setup? The Lord God does not go directly. He doesn't launch directly into speaking to the land. He says, because the enemies have said this about you. Therefore, I'm going to now say something to you. Therefore, mountains of Israel, hear the word of Adonai. Thus says Adonai Elohim. To whom? It spells it out. To the mountains, the hills, the streams, and the valleys the desolate wastes and cities that are forsaken, which have become prey and derision to the rest of the surrounding nations. Notice, before I move on to the prophecy to the land, notice the present condition of the land. Desolate wastes and cities that are forsaken, which have become prey and derision to the rest of the surrounding nations. Before the Lord God comes and heals you, now I'm referring to people like us. This is our condition. You're a desolate place. You cannot provide any nourishment to anybody who stops by, who visits with you. You have nothing to offer them. You're desolate and forsaken. And then the Lord God came and prophesied to each one of us and woke us up and gave us life. And so now he speaks to the land. The land that is desolate and has cities that are forsaken, he says, in verse 5, Therefore thus says Adonai Elohim, Surely in the fire of my wrath I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom that have taken my land for themselves as a possession with the joy of all their heart and contempt in their souls in order to seize it as plunder. 
the Lord God still has not given his word to the land. This is all the lead up to that, right? He's saying, all of these things are causing me now to wake up and speak to you, my land. He says, in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom that have taken my land for themselves as a possession with the joy of all their heart and contempt in their souls in order to seize it as plunder. Therefore prophesy to the land of Israel and say to the mountains and the hills, the streams and the valleys, thus says Adonai Elohim. Behold, I have spoken in my wrath and in my fury because you have suffered the scorn of the nations. By the way, do you see how he's a zealous God for the land, for his land, for the land where he chose to put or place his name? This is that land. The Lord God is zealous for you and me just the same way. When our enemies, the enemies of God, come and steal us and ravage us and plunder us, our God wakes up and fights for us. It says in the fire of my wrath. You are not alone in the battles that you're facing today. This same God who was awakened by the enemies who stole what belongs to someone else, that same God in his wrath and his fury is going to fight for you. This is a holy God. No one can come to his holy mountain and not be consumed unless they are in Messiah. The Lord God still has not spoken his prophecy to the land. We are still in the preamble. But in the preamble, he's, he identifies a few objects of his wrath. In verse 5 it says, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. Take note of that. The rest of the nations and all Edom. Because we're going to come back to that. What and who is this? And I think that will be most of our focus today. But pay attention to that. Alright, continuing verse 7. Therefore, thus says Adonai Elohim. I have lifted my hand. Surely the nations that surround you will themselves suffer scorn. But you mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel, for their return is near. That, that's finally, he got, the Lord God gets to the point, right? <laughs> the, the mountains are waiting. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> what do you have for me? Here it is. You will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel, for their return is near. For behold, I am for you. This is what the Lord God says to us. I am for you. I will turn to you. You will be tilled and sown. I will settle a large population upon you, the whole house of Israel, all of it. And as I've mentioned in the previous parts of the series, the whole house of Israel is in focus. Remember Israel after Solomon was split into two kingdoms. And the Lord God now when he's restoring the people back to the land, he is also bringing the people together, the, the split groups together. He's always about restoration in many different dimensions. Uh, I, I, would, I should say in all dimensions. Everything that is broken and divided because of sin, he's restoring, reuniting, all of that. When he's putting us together, he's not just dealing with one part of you. He may do it in stages, but he is committed to dealing with all of the aspects. So you may have had a traumatic encounter with Yeshua. I don't mean when you were born again, but after you were born again, right? He does things in stages. So maybe five, ten years ago, something happened where the Lord God intervenes in a, in a very interesting, powerful way. And he, he does some house cleaning, right? And it's like, wow, that was, um, let's say you're done with the process. You're like, Phew. that was intense, but that was good and necessary. The Lord God needed to take care of some stuff in me. And then you're like, wow, that was good. And then five years later, right, he comes back. He says, uh, yeah, there's a next layer that we have to deal with, right? There's the next surgery. 
uh, phase two of that chemotherapy or whatever it is. Um, so he's committed. He's committed to making everything whole. He's committed to having all of you, I mean, when I say all of you, I mean the, all of your being in shalom. That's what he's committed to. Not just one area. It's all of it. Verse 11, I will multiply man and beast upon you. They will increase and be fruitful. I will cause you to be inhabited as you were before. I will do better for you than at your beginnings. Which one of us wants that? Amen. To be in a better place than when we began our walk with him. If he's going to do this for the land, the inanimate, how much more will he do it for us? I will do for you better than at your beginnings. And m many of us who've been walking with Yeshua for decades, we know this is true. You can feel it, right? Lord willing, you are at a better place today than the day that you first began. And the day that you first began your journey with him, you thought, wow, how, ma how amazing. This is, you know, this is like uh, something that's never happened to me uh, ever. And this is so beautiful, so awesome. And now here you are, 20, 30 years later, you're like, wow, this is even better than that day. It just gets better when you walk with our king, with your king, with our bridegroom. Just gets better. All we need to do is keep showing up, pre keep presenting ourselves and say, Hineni, have your way in me, my king, my God. I will do better for you than at your beginnings. You will know that I am Adonai. I will cause people. Then it says, which people? My people Israel. This is verse 12. I will cause people, my people Israel, to walk upon you. They will possess you and you will be their inheritance. You will no longer deprive them of children. You know what that means? Once they come back, they're not going anywhere. You're going to give them everything that I m made the earth for. Right? God made the earth for a reason. How it was to, if I can use, if I can use this word, how it was to minister to the descendants of Adam and Eve, the ones that he made in his own image. The earth was made to minister to them, to serve them, to be their provision. And so now the Lord God is saying, you will no longer deprive them of children because you are going to give them everything that I made you to provide my children. Everything that I had in mind when I made you, you're going to give my children. You're not going to withhold it anymore. Let me pause here for a second before we continue and just call out or highlight a few things that we've seen so far. Yahweh's fury and wrath against the enemies of Israel, against the enemies of the land of Israel, simultaneously does two things. One, bless Israel through the restoration of the land and is prospering. Two, exact judgment on the enemies of Israel. And more of this is coming up. He does both of these things simultaneously. So these chapters in Ezekiel are not simply about restoration of the land. While he is restoring Israel, he is also taking care of other business. The Lord is very good at this. He can do multiple things at the same time. I have a picture of my, from the wedding, I have a, there's a one picture that uh, caught my attention. Um, my mom, so Sam's grandma, she has her hands around the bride, Sam's bride, Cassie, with one hand. So she's receiving Cassie into the family. With the other hand, she, is, she has her hand behind our son's head. Like he's take, she's taking care of something. Maybe there was, a, I don't know, something on his coat or simultaneously doing two things. I'm like, wow, look what women can do. <laughs> simultaneously pay attention to multiple things because our God made you. We guys, we, we, we are experts at what? Focusing on one thing and we'll give it everything. But don't come and tell us, talk to us about other stuff while we're doing that one thing. He made us different but we complete each other. So the Lord God is simultaneously blessing Israel through its restoration and prospering, but also exacting judgment on the enemies of Israel. 
So uh, the enemies of Israel are actually named. It says Edom and the nations. Who is Edom? Or in Hebrew it would be Edom. Who is Edom? Now Edom is also referred to in some portions, some parts of the Bible as Mount Seir. They're used synonymously. And both Edom and Mount Seir, the roots of these names trace back to an interesting individual. Jacob's brother, Esau. Let's step back for a second and look at what's happening. The Lord is speaking of which land? The land of Israel. Where did the name Israel come from? It was first given to Jacob. When he says the land of Israel, he might as well say the land of Jacob. Because Jacob is Israel. And when you speak, when the Lord God identifies the enemies of this land, he says, Edom goes back to his brother. The one who was in the same mother's womb. And the two nations struggling in the womb of their mother. That's interesting, right? Esau, by the way, in uh, Hebrew, it's Esav. Esav. So Esau is Esav. Um, you don't have time today to get the details of how these names came about. You know, how did we get from Esau or Esav to Edom and Mount Seir? That's the message by itself. For our purpose today, it is just good to note the, um, the characteristics of these two groups that are mentioned here, which is Edom and the nations. So, so let's, let's uh, take a few minutes to pay attention to what exactly is God saying about these enemies that he has identified. Um, and the reason we want to do this, again, stepping back, big picture, what, why are we talking about any of this stuff? It is because we want to we want to answer the question: Is the birth of the modern state of Israel in 1948 is that a prophetic fulfillment of what we read in Ezekiel and Amos? Right. So, as part of the part of the process by which we answer that question, we want to assemble the criteria that is laid out for us, which says, "Hey, when the restoration happens, these are the things that accompany it." Right. And part of the things that accompany it have to do with the enemies of the land. So we need to pay attention to the enemies of the land because that's going to be part of our checklist. Okay, that's why we're focusing also on the enemies of Israel of the land in particular and not just what is God saying to Israel. Okay. Ezekiel 36:5 says, "Surely in the fire of my wrath I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom." What is this issue with them again? It says the following text they have taken my land for themselves as a possession. P problem number one, right? They have taken my land for themselves as a possession. In other words, they have taken that which is not theirs. Second, it says, they have done this with the joy of all their heart. In other words, they didn't come to this and kind of accidentally do it or take it and then say, oh, sorry, I didn't know it was yours. No, with the joy of their heart. Have you ever seen evil like this, right? When someone comes and steals something and says, yeah, I want more, right? What I did right now, what I stole from me, I want to do more of it. Yeah, <laughs> right? And, and everybody's cheering and there's a lot of rejoicing in this. Actually, we've seen this kind of stuff, okay? Um, so with the joy of their heart, they do this. And then it says, and, and contempt in their souls in order to seize it as plunder. There's a contempt in their souls Contempt for what? For the people that this land was given to. Yes. And for the land. Contempt for the people who belonged to the land, or the land to which, to who the people were assigned, and also the land. They're not just coming and taking your property and saying, oh, now, you know, okay, we stole it from you. Yes, yes, we stole it from you. Now we'll take care of it. We love the land. No. There is contempt because they know this land belonged to them, we hate them, and we hate their land. At the outset, I, I mentioned that there were three chapters, Ezekiel 34, 36, 37, which speaks to the restoration. I skipped 35. Um, 35 gets into the details about these enemies that have been identified. 
So Ezekiel 35 is all about the judgment upon Edom. And uh, we'll dive into that a little bit. Ezekiel 35, verses 1 to 3. The word of Adonai came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. Do you see how within these few chapters, which are adjacent to each other, there's a juxtaposition of two different kinds of prophecies. One is prophetically awakening the land, and the other is a prophesy against Edom and the nations. Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. Say to it, thus says Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you. Mount Seir, I'm against you. I will stretch out my hand over you and I'll make you utterly desolate. At the beginning of Ezekiel 36, who was desolate? The land of Israel was desolate. Now he's saying to the enemies of the land, the enemies of the land and the l enemies of the people of the land, he's saying, I will make you desolate. I will lay your cities waste, you will be devastated, so you will know that I am Adonai. Here's another interesting principle of the Lord God. Even when he was sending the plagues on Egypt, one of the reasons, and he tells you this in the Torah, right, he says, the Egyptians will know that I am Adonai. Here's the, I keep talking about the big picture, right, so if you step back from all of this, and what is the ultimate big picture? The Lord God is restoring everything, including people from among the enemies of Israel. Remember, at the last day, there is going to be people from all nations, tongues, and tribes. So some nations who have given themselves to being on the other side, from even among them, there is a restoration, there is a call to the Lord God that's happening. And this is why it's important for us to not get partisan to the point of hating those who hate God. Let me say that again. There are people who are objectively standing on the other side, other side of truth, right? Just guard your hearts and minds that you don't get to the point of hating them. And this is a difficult thing to do. I struggle myself and I have to constantly seek the Lord, I have to repent and I have to ask the Lord, Lord, Please examine me and show me, have I gone too far? Because some of them belong to the Lord and they'll come to him one day. So don't stand against them. So stand against evil, not against the souls that the Lord God has created. Verse five of Ezekiel 35, because you have a long-standing hatred and who is you? You is Edom. Because you have a long-standing hatred and have delivered B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, it is a declaration of Adonai, I will destine you for blood and bloodshed will pursue you. So here the Lord God gets into the reason that he calls them out, the reason they're, they're found wanting. They found lacking in the eyes of Adonai. He identifies it. He says, you have a long-standing hatred. You, Edom, you have a long-standing hatred towards what? Towards my people. And, and, and Edom, if you are... If you think what I just said is false, right? If you think that I falsely accused you, the Lord God is saying, let me show you an, ex an exhibit. You gave the children of Israel to the power of the sword in their time of calamity. In other words, when they were suffering at the hands of some enemy, you aided the enemy. You gave them to the enemy. Why would you do that? It's not like they did anything to you. You, of your own volition, jumped into the middle of that conflict and you aided the enemy. You helped the enemy. And I saw that. The Lord God says, I saw that, right? I'm, and I'm calling you out for it. You have a long-standing hatred and have delivered B'nai Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, it's a declaration of Adonai. I will destiny you for blood and bloodshed will pursue you. 
Since you do not hate bloodshed, therefore bloodshed will pursue you. Here's a key principle. The Lord God holds in contempt all those who rejoice in and contribute to the suffering of Israel while Israel is being disciplined at the hands of the Lord. Two things can happen simultaneously, right? The Lord God, one, is disciplining Israel. And there are those bystanders who are watching and saying, Oh, what's happening? Uh, maybe the Lord God is punishing them. What do you do as a bystander? You can get involved and you can do a couple things. Edom, what Edom does is, Edom jumps in the middle of it, and Edom uses those, or stands with those whom the Lord God has raised up to discipline Israel, for example. Nebuchadnezzar was raised up by whom? The Lord God. Why? To discipline Israel. Matter of fact, it's in the word of God, right? The other nations who are watching this can do a couple of things. They can say, oh, Israel is suffering. I know Israel has done some things wrong. They've forsaken their God and God is calling them back to him by disciplining them. I wish they'll come back to God. I pray for them that they will repent. That's one approach. The other is like, yeah, 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 uh, Nebuchadnezzar, more, more. In fact, you know what? We'll come join you. Did God ask to come and join, ask you to join Nebuchadnezzar? No. You didn't have to, but you chose to. Why? And the Lord, the Lord God is able to identify, you know, he's good at, again, doing multiple things at the same time. He says, yes, I'm disciplining Israel. Uh, yes, I raised up Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to discipline them. Oh, who are you? Uh, where did you show up from? And what is your involvement in this? Did I call you to the party? What's going on? Like, what? Oh, I see. You are um, motivated by a deep-seated, long-standing hatred of Israel. Israel did nothing to you, and you just want to jump in and, and help, uh, the destroy, help the destruction of Israel. I see that. I, I'm going to call you out on it. That's what's happening. So the Lord God holds in contempt all those who rejoice in and contribute to the suffering of Israel while Israel is being disciplined at the hand of the Lord. Okay. And this is why those who belong to the kingdom right now, right, we were in a situation not unlike this. October 7th, something happened, right? And we could say, huh. Simultaneously, we could say two things, right? Or we could say, I guess there's some sort of disciplining happening. That the Lord God is disciplining them for what purpose? To bring them back to Him, right? Sometimes that's how you get your children's attention, right? Okay, that's fine. What did you do? Did you weep with them? Did you lend them a shoulder to cry on? Or did you say, Hamas, go ahead, more. Yeah, in fact, we'll support you. We'll send funds. People did, people, you know, stood on either one of those. And then maybe there were others who were just silent, which is also a problem. Uh, the Lord God, He notices all these things. And we saw when the things of October 7, the attack unfolded, we did see many rejoicing, did we not? They were displayed, they were, they were captured, handing out whatever sweets and rejoicing like they were worshipping. Rejoicing like they were worshiping God. That's what he saw here in Edom. Verse 10, Ezekiel 35. Here is the Lord God's detailed analysis of the guilt of Edom. Beginning verse 10. Because you said, these two nations and these two lands will be mine. Edom, it's not yours. But Edom, you did say that this land is going to be yours. And you said, we will possess them, though Adonai was there. Therefore, as I live, it is a declaration of Adonai, I will deal with you with the same anger and envy that you had because of your hatred against them. Uh, this is interesting. Edom, you, had, you were animated by a particular anger and envy, envy of Israel. I am going to have that same anger and envy against you. I will make myself known among them when I judge you. So Edom is going to be judged. You will know that I, Adonai, have heard all your blasphemies that you uttered against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given for us to devour. 
And just pause here for a second. He has heard all your blasphemies. You, some of us have been falsely accused of many things. And you can't even keep track of how many things you've been accused of. There are things that you don't even know that the enemies have spoken and done behind your back. You know what? You don't need to keep track. Look at what the Lord God says. I have heard all your blasphemies. Verse 13. You, meaning Edom, you have magnified yourself against me with your mouth. Ultimately, the enemies of Israel are not fighting against Israel, the people. They're fighting against God. You have magnified yourself against me with your mouth. You multiplied your words against me. Huh. You multiplied your words against me. And I heard it. I heard all of it. Verse 14. Thus says Adonai Elohim, When the whole earth rejoices, I will make you desolate. As you rejoice over inheriting the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so I will do to you. You rejoice when... Israel become, became desolate. The whole world is now going to rejoice when you become desolate. You will be desolate, Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. Then they will know that I am Adonai. Going back to verse 5, it says, Because you have a long-standing hatred and have delivered ch the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity. This is the reason that the Lord says, I have a problem with you, Edom. The Lord God does not falsely accuse anybody, right? Fal does not falsely accuse even the enemies of God because he's a just God. He's consistent. He says, look, I'm going to tell you exactly what you did wrong. You have a long-standing hatred for Israel and because of that, you have delivered uh, the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity. So I want to briefly ask the question, what exactly is the Lord God speaking of like when did this happen right when did they do this when did Edom deliver the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of uh, their calamity meaning the time of Israel's calamity like when did this happen I want to ask that I want to answer that question and I also want to address the fact that the Lord God says you have a long-standing hatred what does that mean you have a long-standing hatred so let's let's understand the long-standing hatred first and then we'll look at when exactly Edom delivered Israel to the hands of the enemy. So it started with a long-standing hatred, or the ancient hatred. And by the way, this is a good thing to keep in mind. It's separate from the topic at hand, but it's a good thing to keep in mind, which will help you understand a lot of other things that's happening in the Bible and happening in our world today. Understanding the ancient hatred. So let's review. We're going to go to Genesis 25. Isaac prayed to Adonai on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Who is Isaac's wife? Rebecca. Adonai or Rivka. Adonai answered his plea and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. But the children struggled with one another inside her. And she said, if it's like this, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of Adonai. Adonai said to her, two nations are in your womb. Okay, that's already revealing and telling us a lot. Not one nation shared by two brothers. No, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from your body who will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other people, but the older will serve the younger. All right, so two nations are in your womb and they will be divided. This is kind of the beginning of that understand, beginning of the unpacking of the long-standing hatred. And I'll fast forward to now the time so we, were, we dealt with what happened when they were in their mother's womb, right? There's a prophecy given. And fast forward to the time when they are young men, grown up. And who is their dad? Who, uh, you know, the two sons are Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau. And the dad is Isaac. And Isaac is ready to bless them. And he blesses the two sons. Now this is Genesis 20, 27. And it's obvious that the blessing given to Jacob is gr greater than the blessing given to Esau, if you can call it a blessing, right? So Esau, is, Esau heard what the father just said. And then right after the blessing is done, blessing over the two sons, in verse 41 of Genesis 27, 
Look at what Esau's response is. It says, so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, let the time for mourning my father draw near. In other words, as soon as my dad is dead, so that I can kill my brother Yaakov. This is the intimation of that long-standing hatred. Who is Edom? Edomites are the descendants of Esau. What the father said that day, what the father resolved in his heart, continued with his descendants. So that is the background to the long-standing hatred. You can see where it started. Now let's get to answer the question, when exactly did Edom hand over the children of Israel to the power of the sword when Israel was in the time of their calamity? So the answer is this. When Jerusalem was taken by the Chaldeans, who are the Chaldeans? Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian invasion. The Edomites not only rejoiced at what was happening, they said, yay! Supporting what was happening, they took part of the spoil. They stood in the crossways and slew those that made their escape, or drove them back upon the sword of the enemy, or delivered them into their hands, which was barbarous and inhuman usage of their neighbors and their brethren. Who is Edom? Descendants of Esau. Who is Esau? The brother of Jacob, the brother of Israel. We somehow forget that. This is his brother. What did they do? They not only rejoiced at what Nebuchadnezzar was doing, they participated in it to the point, right? They slew those who escaped. Some Israelites were escaping. You, know, you can go back to October 7th. You know, people were, you know, the young folks at the festival, they were trying to escape. Imagine there was somebody standing and saying, Oh, I see two escaping. Stop them, right? And let's chase them back into the hands of Hamas. Yes. Can you imagine the mindset that would do it? That's, what, that's a perfect representation of what God is speaking here. They drove them back upon the sword of the enemy. The Lord God took notice of this. And there is a prophet, another prophet, Obadiah. Obadiah has just one chapter. That one chapter is devoted to speaking of the judgment on Edom. Obadiah chapter 1, or the only chapter of Obadiah, verse 10, it says, Because of your violence to your brother Jacob, shame will come, or shame will cover you, and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried away his wealth, while foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. In other words, when those people came against your brother and did these things, you acted like one of the foreigners instead of standing with your brother. You should not look down on your brother on the day of his disaster. Meaning you should not have done that. Nor should you rejoice over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. You should not speak proudly in the day of their distress. In other words, you did all of this, but you should not have. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you. Do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster. Yes, you. Do not loot their wealth in the day of their calamity. Do not stand at the crossroad to cut down his fugitives. And do not imprison his survivors in the day of distress. In other words, there were some people somehow who were escaping. You hunted them down. Instead of saying, oh, thank God some people escaped. You hunted them down. For the day of Adonai is near against all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your dealing will return on your own head. I'll go to another prophet now, Prophet Amos. Amos 1.11. I'm focusing on Edom. Thus says Adonai, for three crimes of Edom, even for four, I will not relent. And he lists them. Like he is in a courtroom. He's like, exhibit number one, exhibit number two. This is why I have a problem against you, Edom. Number one, he pursued his brother with a sword. Number two, and stifled his compassion. In other words, you should have had compassion for your brother, but you did not. You stifled your compassion. 
That's number two. Number three, for his anger tore continually and he kept his wrath forever. This, in other words, here's number three, right? Your long-standing hatred for your brother, you just fanned it right, to, to, you know, to, to give it life and, and it tore continually and he kept his wrath forever. The issue that you had with your brother back in the day because of that one thing, right? You, you maintained it. You never walked away from it. You kept it forever. So here are the three sins of Edom that the Lord God is pointing out. And, and it's not too difficult for us to envision, imagine this, because we witnessed something like this on October 7th last year. About, about 10 months ago to this day, October 7th, um, what happened? Hamas, in an assault that it dubbed Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, led the most devastating attack on Israel since its independence. It began with a barrage of at least 2,200 rockets in just 20 minutes, providing cover for at least 1,500 militants who infiltrated Israel at, at dozens of points along the heavily fortified border by using explosives, bulldozers, and paragliders. They not only attacked military outposts, but also killed families inside their homes. And att attendees of an outdoor music festival, within hours, about 1,200 people were dead, and some 240 people were taken hostage. Adding to the trauma of the event was the fact that it was the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust. And we witnessed this during our day. We got to see two kinds of responses after the event. Those who felt the pain of Israel and stood with them, lend them a shoulder to cry on. Others who overtly or maybe tacitly, piled on what was happening, right? Piled on and showing either great glee that this happened to Israel and or continue to actively contribute to the further suffering of Israel. Driven by what? Some sort of long-standing hatred and envy. Some of the participants of this are supposedly from the house of God. Some are from the house of God, and some are outside the house of God. God sees everything. He'll hold everybody to account. And as the people of God, composed of both Jews and Gentiles, when we see a disciplining that's happening to our brother, we do not rejoice in the pain and the suffering. We come alongside them. We pray for them that if they needed to repent of something, that they would repent quickly and receive the refreshing from Adonai. That's what we are supposed to do. As it says in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. I've said uh, about that particular verse in the past, when, it's, when it says, I will curse those who curse you. The curse is the withholding of the blessing. When God withholds his blessing, you're under a curse. For us and our future generations, we cannot remain silent. We cannot be neutral parties to anything. We have to be on the side of the Lord. Um, that does not mean we say everything that Israel or any Jewish person does is always right. No, even the Lord doesn't say that, right? It just says, do not rejoice in their suffering. Do not add to the suffering when I might actually be disciplining my children. Do not come and do that. I mean, think about a father, right? If he has two kids, he's, uh, one of the child is acting up, and he says, time out, you're going to go to your room and you know, withhold some things. And the other brother walks by the room every time, looks at his brother and says, ha-ha, good job, dad. Can you give him some more? Or do you look at your brother in compassion? Oh, I feel bad for you. But dad's watching, so I'm just going to walk by. But I, you know I'm rooting for you, right? Which one? All right, let's, uh, let's pray. And I pray especially for the ecclesia, those who are within the ecclesia, that they would have, that their eyes would be open and they would know what the Lord's heart is. And they would not simply be given to the works of the enemy and operate in the spirit of the Edomites and all the nations of whom God speaks in Ezekiel. I pray that they would repent, their eyes would be opened, and they would stand with the Lord and intercede for all those that the Lord loves, beginning with Israel. Let's pray. Father, we um, 
thank you for the understanding that you give us from the words of your prophets that you've given them. And Lord, we ask that as you continue to connect all the dots for us, that we would be a people who are uh, informed by the events of the past, the events of the present, and the words of the prophets, that when things unfold, that we would be in total shalom because we have heard from our Father in heaven already about these things, that we would be a people that are ready and prepared to enter into the assignments, the tasks that you will give us in those days, in those situations. So Lord, we ask, I ask that each one of us, uh, those who are listening right now and those who would be listening eventually, that we would be completely given to the purification, the cleansing, the sanctification that you're doing with us, that we would that we would so radically be given to that because if we don't do that, Lord, we would be like those from Edom. So Lord, we are not too far away from them. Even, even now as we can understand what you're saying about Edom and we feel like we are not Edom, we are not too many steps away from any of these things but for your mercy and your grace. So Lord, I ask that, um, that we would not be, become proud or haughty and say, oh, that's not us but rather throw ourselves at your mercy, at your kindness, at your forgiveness and your everlasting love for us and say, Lord, keep me, keep me from participating in those kinds of things and continue to purify me that, that I would always be walking in the ways that you have ordained for your people. So Lord, that's my prayer for myself and all of my brothers and sisters. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yivarecha Adonai Bayishmarecha, Yair Adonai Panavilecha, Vichonecha, Isa Adonai Panavilecha, Vesem Lacha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom through a Sar Shalom, Yeshua Messiah. Amen, be Amen. Hallelujah. For more content like this, like, follow, and subscribe. Thank you.